and you to ask the first question. Mr. Kilgeny. Question number one, please. I'm aware of the initiative announced by the Justice Minister for Ireland to expunge convictions for certain repealed offences in relation to prostitution. I understand that her department has commissioned a review of the criminalisation of the purchase of sex provisions introduced in the Criminal Law Sexual Offences Act 2017. Legislation to provide for the expungement of convictions for offences repealed by the 2017 Act will await the outcome of and recommendations made in that review. It is often the case that human trafficking is linked with other organised crime within the sex industry, and also that victims may be targeted for sexual exploitation because of their vulnerabilities, which include, could include poverty and drug addiction. There are existing protections in Northern Ireland for those forced into prostitution through no act of their own. Under Section 22 of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Criminal Justice and Support for Victims Act, Northern Ireland 2015, a slavery or trafficking victim is not guilty of an offence where the person does the act because they are compelled to do so. I will be meeting with Helen McEntee in the near future and I will discuss the issue further with her. I will continue to monitor developments in Ireland and consider their applicability for Northern Ireland. Mr Gildernew. Margaret, and, uh, Minister, you have largely, I think, answered, answered my question in relation to the expunging of records, and you clearly are aware that this has taken place in uh, 26 counties. Um, are you indicating that you will, you're, you're making a firm commitment that the records of those who have been victims of trafficking, that, who have been convicted for prostitution or offences of that nature, will be expunged? With respect to those who are victims of trafficking, they are already not guilty of an offence where they are uh, where they are complicit in an act because of compulsion. So they would already not be convicted of an offence in Northern Ireland. However, my officials will explore in liaison with colleagues in the Irish Justice Department the approach that's being taken in relation to making legislative provision there for historic offences. My department will also undertake research on how victims of human trafficking might be identified and the potential number of convictions for all repealed prostitution offences. Once I have all the relevant information available, I will then consider a way forward. Mr John Blair. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you. Given the appropriate emphasis placed on this issue by the police, the policing board and, and indeed the department, can I ask the Minister what advice she would give to those who come across what they believe to be modern slavery? Well, I think that anyone who comes across a situation that they believe may be linked to modern slavery um, has not just a moral duty, um, but I think a duty to wider society to report that as early as possible to the police. Um, we know that there are people in our community who have been trafficked here, there are people trafficked within our communities, and there are people trafficked from here to elsewhere. And it's hugely important that the public are aware of the signs of trafficking. There's been a lot of work done by a huge number of voluntary organisations and partner bodies with us to raise awareness of human trafficking and the signs. And I would hope that people would make themselves familiar uh, with indicators of human trafficking and would have the confidence to come forward um, and make disclosure to the police uh, where they believe that there may be human trafficking involved. Ms Sinead Bradley. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer on this question. Um, the Minister cited other legislation against other um, cases that may be held against the person who has been established as being trafficked and that the record uh, would be expunged in that manner. But has the Minister given any thought to joining the dots in all those pieces of legislation to ensure that any person found to be trafficking really does walk away with the, an appropriately clean record? Well, it is already the case that any offence that is committed under coercion um, by somebody who is, an, uh, who is a, a victim of human trafficking um, will not be guilty of an offence um, where, where there is coercion involved. And those, additional, those existing protections are there. I think the issue then would be what happened before 2015, for example, for people who may have been prosecuted um, for coerced prostitution at that time. Of course, there will be further gaps. Um, the member will be aware um, through her membership of the Justice Committee that we are indeed looking at areas around human trafficking and what we can do for victims um, of uh, human trafficking um, in that um, piece of legislation. And it would be my hope um, that we would continue to refine and improve what we do in terms not just of our support um, for victims of human trafficking, but also um, in terms of our prevent strategy and our pursue strategy. Because what I would like to see are the organised criminals who are behind human trafficking taken off our streets. Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. I think the scourge of human trafficking 
is an all too common sight still in our streets, unfortunately. And uh, my thoughts are with all of those who have been impacted. Could the minister perhaps outline what current support packages are, 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 are existing to help uh, those that have been uh, the subject of human trafficking? And does she further believe that the police are doing enough to try and end this, uh, this scourge of activity? Well, I think that there are a number of parts to that question. I think with respect to the support that we offer, uh, we're about to put that on a statutory footing in terms of the bill which is going through the committee at the moment, but we have extended beyond the current uh, minimum provision already in Northern Ireland. That was done um, actually by David Ford in his time as Minister of Justice, and we intend to put that on a statutory footing. Um, there is also, in terms of the work that is being done by the PSNI, uh, there has been an incredible amount of work done. There are a number of people who are considered first responders when it comes to human trafficking. And so what we're looking for is an increase in the number of referrals to the national referral mechanism. I think that will reflect both an increase in the scale of modern slavery and human trafficking, but also will reflect in a greater level of awareness of the issue um, that may have contributed to increased identification of victims. But then we also want to see increased numbers of prosecutions. These are very um, complex crimes, often um, the actual crime has been committed elsewhere rather than here, um, and so it can be very difficult in terms of securing convictions. Um, but however, despite those challenges, I think it is hugely important that the PSNI continue to enhance their capacity in tackling those crimes and through engaging with other law enforcement agencies and stakeholders are continuing to pursue offenders using all the available tools at their disposal. Ms. Carol McKillen. Question number two, please. I welcome the publication of the Sujeni thematic inspection on how the criminal justice system treats females in conflict with the law in Northern Ireland. It provides a useful insight into the challenges faced by women transitioning through and out of the justice system. I also recognise the need, as suggested by Sujeni in their inspection, to move from a gender informed to a more gender responsive approach. This is not about a different standard being applied to police actions, prosecution decisions or probation practice because of the defendant being a woman or a girl. Rather, it is about how the criminal justice organisations and our partners take account of and deliver services specific to women and girls to provide equitable outcomes. I remain committed to supporting and improving life chances and outcomes for women and girls who come into contact with the justice system. However, I also recognise that given the range of issues involved, this is not something justice can do alone. Therefore, I am grateful for the ongoing co-design and delivery working we enjoy with voluntary community and statutory partners. I have carefully considered the full range of strategic and operational recommendations contained in the report and have asked my officials to ensure these are considered in full before our new justice-wide strategy supporting women and girls, will come into con uh, women and girls who come into contact with the justice system is finalised. The strategy will be trauma-informed and focus on the breadth of contact women and girls have with the justice system seeking to support them at an early stage in the community and within and beyond custody. The strategy is under development and we will be seeking to publish around the end of the financial year. My officials will naturally be keeping in contact with Ginny as we progress that work. Ms Nicola. Minister, I appreciate your responses. You have actually asked her two, two questions I was going to ask. So, um, first of all, I welcome your support for the CJI re report. Um, which is really, really important. And you've also alluded to the fact that you're with Co-Design Co-Production in mind, you're still looking at part of your strategy. So will that be part of your strategy along with those partners, the NGOs, to ensure that the disproportionate outcomes for women and girls within the justice system is actually looked at through the lens of better equality but better life outcomes as well? I think it's hugely important that we do that, and I think there is a need for a strategic approach right across the criminal justice system and justice agencies when we're working with women. I also accept that there is more we can do within individual agencies and across justice to address the needs of women and girls in a more gender responsive and trauma informed way. The most appropriate vehicle to deliver on that. Um, is the new justice-wide strategy for women and girls in contact with the justice system. And so I think if we can work with our partners in terms of co-design, we will be able to get the best possible outcome for that, uh, which, as I say, hopefully will be able to be produced in this mandate. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Justice Minister's commitment to early intervention to preventing offending by women and girls, but obviously we will require prison accommodation for those who enter our care. Could the Minister provide an update on the new female facility? 
Um, the target date for the delivery of the new female facility um, subject to the necessary funding being made available is mid-2025. The estimated cost for the project is £33.5 million. Delays in the development could, however, increase costs through construction cost inflation and the potential loss of resource savings. I am committed to delivering that strategy, which focuses on supporting women and girls as early as possible, but I am also um, absolutely committed to ensure that, where appropriate, where women are held in custody, we do so um, in the best possible circumstances. Thank you. I now, via Starleaf, I call up Ms Linda Dillon to ask her question. Question number three. I welcome the Public Accounts Committee report, which highlights the scale of the challenge we face in tackling delay in the Crown Court cases. These are often the most serious cases, which can have a big impact on victims and on public confidence in the system. It was pleasing that the PAC noted some of the work that has been ongoing to date to speed up the justice system, and one area in particular the report focused on relates to digital working. This has been particularly important in the context of COVID and has enabled justice organisations to work within relevant health guidelines and is something that we will look to build on further. However, the report also acknowledges that backlogs created by COVID will take time to clear. In the report, the PAC acknowledged the significant role that committal reform will have on speeding up Crown Court cases and alleviating stress on victims and witnesses. It is timely, therefore, that the committal reform debate is back before the Assembly for debate this afternoon, immediately after questions conclude. Ms Dillon for supplementary. I would and thank the Minister for her answers so far. Minister, also outlined in that report is one of the failures in speeding up justice is the, the lack of connected working and partnership working in between those agencies that come under the justice sphere and having the benefit of having both been on the Justice Committee and on the Policing Board, I know that this is a real issue. And I'm wondering how, how this can be addressed. I know some work has been done, but clearly nowhere near enough, given given what has been highlighted in this report. So I'm just wondering if, if the Minister can respond as to how we can improve on that. Well, my officials are working together with colleagues in the relevant criminal justice organisations to prepare a formal response to the six recommendations in the PAC report, which will be led before the Assembly in due course. I think further work is required to explore the issues that were raised in more detail. However, I realise that more needs to be done to tackle delay in Crown Court cases and broadly welcome the findings, which have the potential to contribute to efforts to tackle delay. The Department provides support to Crown Court Cases performance groups established in 2019 and chaired by the judiciary, bringing together justice agencies and defence lawyers to lead performance improvements at the local level. The Working Together Board, jointly chaired by PSNI and PPS, continues to drive improvements in file quality and the effective of decision making. That is just two examples of where our partnership working has, I think, improved, um, and I think two examples of how we can actually make more progress going forward. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Minister, uh, can you confirm if any research is to be commissioned with relation to the reasons behind the high levels of uh, adjournments and whether these adjournments were on, uh, on, uh, avoidable? In the context of the culture of adjournment, as identified in the report, and considering their negative impact on victims and witnesses. Thank you. The issue of adjournments obviously are one for the um, judge who is, in, uh, who is in control of the court to make a judgment on in terms of whether or not the adjournment that has been sought by either side um, in the court is an acceptable reason for further adjournment. And in making that decision, of course, they will take account um, of the impact on victims, on witnesses and on the accused, because, of course, um, until proven guilty, that is an innocent person who may well be subject to bail conditions or indeed be held on remand. And so it is important as we speed up justice that we look not only to deal uh, with the, the machinery of justice, but also to look at the reasons for adjournment. It is not something, obviously, that we would hold the, um, the statistics on in the department, but it is something that the judiciary obviously are aware of. Mr Chris Little. Question four. On my appointment as Minister of Justice in January 2020, I set out an ambitious legislative programme that involved a proposal to bring forward five separate bills over the remainder of the mandate. 
I'm pleased to advise as a result of the excellent work of the Office of Legislative Council, together with the concerted efforts of departmental officials and the committee, that plan is progressing well. The Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill received royal assent on 1 March, and departmental officials are now progressing measures to facilitate implementation of the new powers contained in the Act. I have two bills that have completed the committee stage in the Assembly, which have now progressed to consideration stage. The Damages Return on Investment Bill, which was debated on Monday 15 November, and the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill, which is due to be debated today. Subject to the completion of the consideration stage debates on these dates, I am planning further consideration and final stages of both bills to be complete before Assembly Christmas recess on 18 December. I currently have two further bills at committee stage in the Assembly, the Protection from Stalking Bill, which is due to complete committee stage on 10 December, and the Justice, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill, committee stage for which has been extended to 28 January 2022. The completion of consideration stage, further consideration stage, and the final stage for both of these bills in the remaining time in the mandate will be challenging, but I am confident of delivering all five of the proposed bills before the Assembly rises for the next local elections in May 2022, and I am grateful for the support of the Assembly and the Committee in being able to do so. Mr Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Justice Minister for the leadership she has shown to deliver such legislative change and executive decision-making that will keep our communities safe? Frequently, in the face of death threats and heinous, misogynistic online abuse, thank you, Minister, for the courage that you show in that regard. There have been many times in this mandate that I am extremely grateful Naomi Long as Justice Minister. And can I ask the Minister for an update on her work to prevent abuse in sport and faith settings? Thank you. I thank the member for his question. I think we are meant to pay tribute to those outgoing members rather than those of us who are intending to run again, so do not write my eulogy just yet, Chris. Um, but I believe um, that it is important that I, I do say to Chris that he has been an incredibly supportive member of this Assembly, but also of my team, and will be hugely missed as a result. I believe that greater protection needs to be provided for our young people in the care of adults who are in a position of trust and environments not currently prescribed in law. As it stands currently, the, the law only protects those young people who are in the care of adults in certain statutory settings, such as education, youth detention, social or hospital care. I intend to change the law to extend the scope of the abuse of provision of trust offences contained within the Sexual Offences Northern Ireland Order 2008 by making an amendment to the Justice, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill at consideration stage. I should mention that I have deliberately sought to bring this proposal forward within this mandate. I had previously intended to develop pro proposals in slower time for introduction in the next mandate, but recent developments such as the introduction of proposals for an extension of the law in England and Wales and further representation from key interests has persuaded me that earlier action is required. Draft clauses are currently in development, but I hope to be able to share these with members soon, particularly with members of the Justice Committee who are currently scrutinising the Bill's content. That said, I can confirm that on the basis of consultation and engagement carried out in partnership with the NSPCC, I intend to extend the scope of the offences to the specific areas of sport and faith at this stage. This reflects those areas that have been highlighted as being of particular concern and where, unfortunately, the abuse of power by adults responsible for children in these settings has become all too prevalent. My other Prilas Kenholia and I um, thank the Minister for her answers so far. Minister, I very much welcome the progress in bringing forward essential legislative change, particularly in the areas of domestic and sexual violence and abuse, and I commend the Minister and her department um, on this. As you are aware, Minister, serious concerns remain that the clauses of the Justice Bill relating to so called upskirting, down blousing and image based sexual abuse do not go far enough to effectively tackle these problems. Minister, um, can you therefore commit to strengthening the bill if required? Well, the bill is now with the committee, um, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and it would be my intention to listen carefully to the feedback that I receive from the committee and where I believe that robust um, alternatives exist that can be included in that bill. I am, of course, open to do that and have demonstrated that, I think, now on a number of occasions um, as we have passed legislation through the House. Members need to also though, reflect on the fact that whilst this may be the last piece of legislation to pass through this mandate, it will not be the last piece of legislation to pass through this House. 
there will be plenty of other opportunities for us in future mandates to be able to improve legislation and refine what we do. So it is important that what we focus on at this point is getting that legislation which is before the House completed um, in order that none of that work that has been put in by the committee, by the department and by our statutory partners goes to loss um, because of running up against the deadline of the end of the mandate. Ms Nicola Brogan. Question number five, please. As members will appreciate, it is not appropriate for a Justice Minister to comment on the sentences imposed by the courts or on associated sentencing guidelines. Sentencing is a matter for the independent judiciary. This is a complex exercise carried out by a highly trained judiciary based on the evidence presented during the course of the trial and guided by any relevant sentencing guidance. Sentencing guidance is also a matter for the courts. It is created to assist judges in ensuring a level of consistency in the sentences that they impose. There is a provision for the review of sentences in the most serious cases. Where a sentence is considered to be unduly lenient, it is open to referral to the Court of Appeal for reconsideration. We have robust legislative frameworks to deal with a variety of sexual offending behaviours, including those carried out against children. The specific offence of making indecent photographs of children in the Protection of Children Northern Ireland Order 1978 carries a maximum sentence on indictment of up to 10 years' imprisonment. Adult offenders convicted of this offence, or those irrespective of age who have been sentenced to at least one year's imprisonment, are subject to notification requirements on the Sex Offenders Register. They also come within scope of civil prevention orders aimed at managing risk, such as the Sexual Offences Prevention Order. Breach of notification requirements or conditions of an SOPO is a criminal offence which carries a maximum sentence of up to five years imprisonment. I am very conscious of perpetrators exploiting the new opportunities arising during the pandemic period, taking advantage of the vulnerabilities of many within our society and their increased use of online communications to stay in touch. I am committed to ensuring that appropriate law is in place to enable our authorities to deal with this kind of abhorrent behaviour. In addition to the offences that currently exist, I am taking forward new provisions within the Justice, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill, which will strengthen the law to provide additional protection for our community. The UK Online Safety Bill is currently making its way through Westminster. The bill provides a particular focus on protecting children and young people from a range of online risks, such as grooming, revenge porn, hate speech, images of child abuse and posts it relating to suicide and eating disorders. The bill also includes proposals on how to address terrorism, disinformation, racist abuse, pornography and online scams. Ms Brogan. I thank the Minister for her answer there as well. Um, Minister, in recent weeks, um, representatives of safeguarding organisations have criticised the current um, sentencing guideline, guidelines um, for cases involving indecent images of children, and particularly in light of cases where um, offenders have avoided prison even after pleading guilty to um, charges for making indecent images of children. So, does the Minister intend to review these sentencing guidelines at all? Sentencing guidance is created um, by the courts. Um, it can take the form of guidance contained in guideline cases, often issued by the highest appeal court, the Court of Appeal, or it can be in guidelines issued by the Lady Chief Justice's Sentencing Group. Its purpose is to assist just judges in coming to what can be complex decisions and ensure there is a level of consistency in sentencing. My own department, therefore, has no role in this particular matter. It also should be borne in mind, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, that one of the considerations that any judge will have to make is the opportunity for rehabilitation of the offender and for management of the risk. And it may be that in certain cases where an offence would attract a rather short um, uh, custodial sentence, that it may be better to provide for a longer non-custodial option in order that more rehabilitative work can be done uh, with the offender rather than them simply exit jail with no um, additional support um, or supervision afterwards. That is a balance that only the judge in charge of the case can seek. And whilst I understand, of course, the reasons why people are concerned when they see these cases, I would encourage people, first of all, to read the full judgment so they fully understand the weight um, that the judge has applied to different issues. And if they remain concerned to write to the Lady Chief Justice, who I know will be more than happy um, to facilitate engagement. Mr John Stewart. <clears throat> Question number seven, please. 
I believe that the common law offences of blasphemy and blasphemy libel are archaic and that they have no place in a modern society. I am committed to freedom of and freedom from religion and am sympathetic to removing such outdated and unused offences from the law. My intention was to remove these common law offences during this mandate. However, as members will be aware, I did not get the full support needed to legislate in this respect as part of a miscellaneous provisions bill. Mr Stewart. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answering for um, responses to me on this matter over the last year or so. Before the laws in blasphemy, which are in reality dead letters, were removed in England and Wales, there was a public consultation, and key stakeholders like the Church of England were in favour of deletion. Why has similar preparatory work not taken place, and will the Minister now commit to seeking the views of church groups and other interested parties in a formal public consultation? Well, the reason that the consultation has not taken place is because we have not developed policy in this area, because there was not sufficient support for us to do so at this time. My department, like every other, has limited resource, and given that we are trying um, to legislate on five particular pieces of legislation that are substantive, um, as well as doing all of the other work that the Justice Department has been engaged on, we would not have the capacity um, to develop policy in an area that is currently not um, listed as one that we would be taking forward legislation on. However, as I have said, it would be my desire to see it done. Um, I believe that there is significant um, benefit from doing so. I also believe that before that happens, there will, of course, be a public consultation. Ms. Kira Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Minister, uh, for your uh, kind words to date. You will be aware that the blasphemy uh, law have been repealed in the South, um, and likewise in England, Wales, and Scotland. Would you agree? And I know you have done previously that although they're still in statute here, they are outdated and they're not representative of a modern Ireland that we live in today. And would you agree that they should be removed as soon as possible? I agree the law is both archaic and, more importantly, unused, um, so it makes sense to abolish it, and my department is competent to legislate in this area. Members are aware um, that I did make efforts to do so um, as part of the overall miscellaneous provisions bill preparations. Unfortunately, that wasn't possible because we ended up with a bill which is much narrower in scope, um, which wouldn't allow us to bring later amendments that might have addressed this issue. However, I believe that it is important not only because it is archaic um, and because it is unused, but because I think it sends out an important message to other jurisdictions where their blasphemy laws are not unused. Um, and where it leads to people who have different faiths to the majority persuasion being persecuted and indeed in some cases um, sentenced to death. It's very difficult to go with any degree of credibility to those countries and demand that they repeal their blasphemy laws while ours remain on the books. Thank you. Uh, Mr John Blair. Principal Deputy Speaker, I think the Minister has touched on this already, but, but I will ask the, the question. Um, I am aware of the Minister's long-standing commitment to freedom of and also freedom from religion. Does she share my frustration that we do not have a legislative vehicle to repeal these offences and that this should now be a priority? I do agree um, that it is frustrating that we do not have a vehicle. It will not be a priority, I have to say, over the coming months in my department, simply because of the pressure of other work um, that we are desirous to get finished um, by March of next year. However, I do believe that it is something that, in the miscellaneous provisions bill, which we hope to bring forward in the next mandate, um, that this is something that will fit comfortably within that. It is not a particularly complex piece of legislation to repeal. Um, I think, as other members have suggested, we would, of course, want to give people the opportunity to respond um, to any public consultation on that, but I do not think it will change dramatically the view that having legislation on the books which is not actually in use and which is archaic in nature is not particularly helpful to anyone. We have about 60 seconds left, so just time for Mrs Barton to ask her question and get an answer. Mrs Rosemary Barton. Question 8. Funding from the Assets Recovery Community Scheme, which is administered by my department, is used to prevent crime or reduce the fear of crime in support of victims, communities or the environment. Since its inception in 2011, the scheme has invested in a wide range of programmes and interventions and has delivered tangible benefits through organisations working for the good of their community and in support of key justice priorities. The effects of the funding allocated to community initiatives under the scheme have, in my view, been entirely positive. Funding awarded has provided a range of positive outcomes for individuals and groups, as well as the wider community. The funding is about using money that would otherwise be lining the pockets of criminals 
funding their lavish lifestyles to support positive action and interactions um, in the community, such as intervention and diversionary activities for young people to prevent them engaging in antisocial behaviour, to help offer those at risk of offending or reoffending a better pathway, supporting people with addictions to improve their health and life chances. It has offered work experience and mentoring initiatives to prisoners and individuals under probation supervision to support their resettlement and reintegration into family and community life and to challenge repeat offending. It has supported initiatives to raise awareness of and address important issues like domestic violence, human trafficking and scams. And it has also delivered community safety initiatives to help people feel safer in their homes and their local community. Thank you, Minister. We now move on to uh, 15 minutes of topical questions. I advise the House of Question number two has been withdrawn. And I call Ms. Cara Hunter. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister uh, for her answer so far today. Uh, Minister, this Thursday is the International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women. Uh, it's reported that one in four young women from the age of 15 to 19 years old have experienced psychological, sexual or physical abuse from their partner. Can I ask the Minister what steps her department are taking to address abuse in young, adolescent, uh, pardon me, young adolescent relationships here in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Well, I thank the member for her question and for her continued interest in this issue. She is, of course, right to highlight um, the issue of violence against women and girls. I think something that we all recognise and see in our communities, but not just through domestic abuse and violence, um, but also through the kind of intimidation, um, misogyny and sexism that we see in our wider society and has a huge impact, not just on young women and girls in terms of their mental health and well-being, but also their aspirations and, uh, and the fact that it limits their life choices um, because of that intimidation and behaviour. It is a priority for me in terms of trying to deal with these issues and it's something that I very much want to see developed. However, when it comes to dealing particularly with young people, I believe the key vehicle for that is through the Department um, for Education. I know that the previous minister, who I see in the chamber at the moment, um, had committed to a review of the minimum content order um, and has had engaged with me um, proactively um, around these issues and how education could play a role in terms of, for example, delivering on the Gillen review uh, when it comes to issues such as consent um, and other matters within the school curriculum. Sadly, that has not um, been reflected in the performance of his um, successor. I have now written on two occasions and have not had any response um, from the Minister for Education um, to get an update on this. And indeed, it would appear, given comments at a recent executive meeting, um, that she has resiled from the idea that there is any review ongoing into RSE in schools. Ms Cara Hunter. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for her response and just to express my support and solidarity with herself uh, following events that had taken place last week. And I agree with her wholeheartedly. I think education really is a big part of the answer um, to teach young people about the, the, uh, what abuse looks like and sounds like. Uh, Minister, I find it extremely disappointing that uh, the Education Minister um, hasn't responded on this matter. Uh, but can I seek assurances from yourself that your department will liaise with the Department of Education wherever possible uh, in the future to ensure our correct is fit for purpose uh, for our young people in these sensitive issues. Thank you. Well, I thank the member for her support, and indeed, I thank many of the members of this chamber um, for their support um, over the last week. Um, I think those of you who know me well enough will know that I will not be deflected um, by bullying, whether it be online or in person. Um, however, I do recognise that there will be those out there who witness it, um, who question whether or not as women they want to step into the public eye and have themselves potentially subjected to such abuse. And I believe that that is, is wrong because it deprives our community of important voices that need to be heard. With respect to continuing to engage with the Department um, of Education, we actually ran three workshops uh, with the Department um, of Education um, and have worked well with their officials in terms of trying to move things forward. However, I do believe it's important that the policy is driven by the Minister and therefore it's important I think that we are able to sit down and have that conversation around how we can move this forward during this mandate um, in the hope of being able to provide for a fresh start in the next mandate because obviously that legislation wouldn't happen in the current mandate. It is hugely important that we provide for proper education around relationship and sex education. It should be age appropriate, it should be sensitive, but it should also be fact based um, and it should be there to equip young people for life. And that means giving young people the information that they need, but also showing them what healthy relationships look like. The assumption that every young person will have a role model for that at home is profoundly flawed. 
when we know that one in three women will have been subjected to domestic abuse and violence. So we need to provide that kind of wraparound support in schools. And we also create an opportunity in doing so for young people to come forward and confide in teachers their experiences of domestic abuse and domestic violence in the home. Ms Nicola Brogan. Jeremy, I got a pre in Corla. Um, can the Minister give her assessment of current legislation regarding the protection of retail workers from abuse and assault, please? Um, at, per, at present, um, the, the Department's focus has been on those working um, in frontline services um, in terms of first responders and others, in terms of providing additional support um, and additional criminal offences in relation to that. With respect to those um, in shop workers and retail environments, we are of course open to listening to a case if one is to be made in terms of additional protections that could be put in place. I think that all of us recognise that those who work in the retail industry um, and indeed who are frontline workers in many other sectors um, are exposed on a daily basis to the public. That can be a joy at times, but as we all know as elected representatives, it is not always so. Um, and so I think it is important that people are properly protected um, and that there is a no tolerance approach taken by employers to protect their employees when such things happen. Ms. Brogan, for a supplementary. Garmi, I have a and call and I thank the Minister for her answer there. Um, a recent survey actually by um, Ulster revealed that 90% of respondents have been assaulted in the last 12 months and one in seven have been physically attacked. And last week was actually it marked respect to shop workers week. So would the Minister agree that um, this is an opportune time to consider more legislative protection to act as a deterrent against this behaviour? Well, I think that there is always an opportunity to reflect, and I think particularly coming out of the COVID pandemic, looking at how shop workers have been um, going the extra mile in terms of supporting the community, I think it is a good time to reflect on those issues. Not all solutions, however, will be legislative solutions. There may be other solutions that can be implemented much more quickly in terms of, for example, providing better support, uh, providing better reporting mechanisms to the police and to others when offences occur. Um, and I think that there is a... a an issue here around how we as a community treat those who work in the service industries around us. The abuse that I see meted out to people, whether it be in shops or whether it be in restaurants or whatever work they do, to me is just completely unacceptable. When people are there to provide a service for you, you have a duty to behave respectfully um, in terms of how you engage with them. Falling short of that should be socially unacceptable, not just against the law. Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, uh, may I ask you for an update on your tackling paramilitary, paramilitarism programme? The purpose of the Cross Executive Programme is to build safer communities, resilient to paramilitarism, criminality, and coercive control. This is important work to end the harm caused to our society by paramilitary groups. Phase two of the programme began in April this year, and implementation of it continues. The projects within the programme continue to work collaboratively to deal with the harm caused by paramilitary groups and support people and communities to build resilience. The programme has continued to support those most vulnerable in our society throughout the pandemic and continues to promote collaboration and problem solving amongst project partners to deal with coercive control from paramilitary groups. The work to tackle paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime will only succeed if it is supported by political leadership from elected representatives to invoke change and create a society where paramilitarism is resigned to the past. We must lead a, a way in which empowers communities and promotes participation. That will enable us best to address some of the challenging issues around the scourge of par paramilitarism in our society. Mr. Dixon. Thank you. I appreciate your, your answer. Minister, Minister, one of the most difficult areas to tackle in relation to paramilitary crime is that of money lending. Um, um, and I'm only too aware in my constituents of East Antrim the corrosive effect that that has had on families and on individuals once they get into the cycle of borrowing from paramilitaries uh, within their community. There are excellent community groups like Christians Against Poverty and others who provide a great deal of support. But they too are hampered because when they go to assist a client to repay the debt, the paramilitaries the are refusing to accept the funds. Minister, will this programme assist in dealing with this scourge of money lending? Well, illegal money lending is very much an underreported crime, but one that we know is causing significant harm within communities. It is underreported for a number of reasons fear um, of retribution, but also shame 
of having got involved um, with paramilitary organisations in order to borrow money. Let me be really clear, there should be no shame involved in those who have borrowed money uh, from individuals in the community who then go on to try to use that indebtedness to abuse that individual and coerce them into activities of which they are not interested in. We talk about human trafficking and we talk about victims of human trafficking, but there are many people in our community who are coerced into drug dealing, into prostitution, into allowing their children to be involved in drug dealing in order to support um, local paramilitary organisations as a result of inability to repay loans. From our research, we know that illegal lenders in the majority of cases are either paramilitaries or are backed by or directed by local paramilitary gangs. This is one of the many ways that paramilitary gangs exploit and harm vulnerable people. The Illegal Money Lending Public Awareness Campaign has been running since June this year, and I would encourage members um, to look on the Justice um, Twitter feed, and um, perhaps not on my Twitter feed, um, unless you want a really depressing read. Um, but you may wish to look at the Justice Twitter feed, um, because there is some really good material there um, about money lending. An evaluation process is in place. A baseline pre-campaign survey was conducted in spring 2021, and that will be repeated in spring 2022 to assess its effectiveness. In the current climate, people are experiencing real financial challenges. With the continuing difficulties presented by the pandemic, an end of the furlough scheme and increasing energy and fuel prices. All of this in the run-up to Christmas. This is a challenging time for many people and will make them more vulnerable to the advances from illegal money lenders. So one of the things that we have done in the campaign is to redirect people towards the kind of advice that they need in order to avoid becoming embroiled with illegal money lenders. To keep the focus on the issue, the next phase of the money lending campaign will launch on Monday the 29th of November and new adverts will run until the end of January 2022. And I would ask members to try and share those and amplify the campaign. It is important for our constituents. Mr Matthew O'Toole. So will that be, Speaker? Um, I just start my remarks by adding my voice to the uh, to those condemn, standing in solidarity with the minister condemning the loathsome uh, uh, bullying she had to put up with online. Not to be flippant, her and I have talked in the past about having hair sharing a hair colour and how you have to deal with um, obnoxious remarks. She's not she's she is not only well able for it, but she is also a, a public representative who has um, who has shown through the test of time that that that, that, that um, she, she won't uh, be bowed by it. Um, Minister, as you know, I represent the most diverse constituency in Northern Ireland, indeed uh, probably the island of Ireland. When I regularly meet uh, with uh, people from uh, the BAME community from different groups, including uh, the week before last, the Sudanese community, what I regularly hear is that they feel that reporting hate crime has become uh, almost pointless. It is uh, a real concern that hate crime is dramatically, race hate crime is dramatically underreported in Northern Ireland. Indeed, Patrick Horgan from Amnesty said recently that this place risks becoming a safe haven for racists. Can I ask the Minister for an update on what she and her department are doing to, uh, to tackle that? Well, the member, first of all, I thank him um, for, for his solidarity. Us redheads do need to stick together. Um, and it is important to remember that, of course, redheads are also fierce and therefore will not be bowed by such abuse. Um, in terms of the hate crime issue, um, we are, as you know, looking at Judge Marinan's report. Um, we are trying to take that forward. There are some areas, I think, where we will need to do further consultation, and we intend to do that um, in the near future. Um, some of the areas are quite complex in terms of how we actually define the hate crime, whether we have it as an aggravating factor to an existing sentence or whether we define it as a crime in itself. However, once that consultation has concluded, we will then be in a position to make the final policy decisions in that regard, hopefully um, next year, and to prepare the rest of the hate crime bill um, for introduction in the next mandate, probably as the second bill in the next mandate after the miscellaneous provisions bill, which I referred to earlier, uh, which will be required as a catch-all a catch for some of the things that had to come out of the current um, justice bill. However, I am hopeful that it is one that will pass this um, assembly uh, with good support, because I think that there is ample evidence um, that people in our community are being subjected to hate crime of many different kinds. I would also encourage people who have the opportunity, um, who see a hate crime being committed or who are subject to a hate crime, not to lose heart, to report it to the police, and if they are dissatisfied with the response that they get from the police, to then report that to the Ombudsman's Office. It should not go unreported. It should not become acceptable, and we should certainly not allow ourselves to become a safe haven for racism. Ten seconds and ten second response. The Minister agree with me that consulting early with uh, our BAME communities in order to give them the confidence that this place is not going to be forever a safe haven for racists as we introduce this bill is critical? Yes. 
And that is the way to do it. Gold star. Um, members, that concludes uh, questions to the Minister for Justice. If members would just take their ease to allow for a change at the top table, we will then move on to the next item of business. Thank you.